Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Our dear Master, our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you for your kindness, your mercy, your abundance of blessings that are never ending. We thank you for your involvement of our lives, for your desiring to draw us closer to you. We thank you for your words that inspire us and teach us. Your words are eternal life. We pray that you will continue to teach us, that you would speak to us, that you would open our minds and you would open our hearts. I pray the work that you have begun in us that you would complete it to the end through your words, your spirit working in us, leading us, teaching us, and transforming us into your image. We ask that you would bless this meeting and be with us and hear us when we say with one voice. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. the sign of a mature spiritual life. Thank you, Charles. God bless you. So that was Philippians. This week is Galatians. So I want you to open your Bibles. Get out your highlighters, your pens. Okay, I'll forgive it again. But hopefully, eventually, you guys will bring your Bibles. So, we're going to Flip a lot through Galatians, so have your Bibles ready, and if you want to highlight, some of these verses uh, are very beautiful. So in Galatians chapter 1, St. Paul was writing to uh, the people in Galatia, and there were a lot of people that were trying to reinforce the Jewish laws, the Jewish customs, and he was trying to combat that. So in Galatians 1, 15 to 16... He wants us to realize that we have a greater purpose in our life. Last week, the mind of Christ is, is part of the process. But there's something that God has called each and every one of us to. So Galatians 1, 15 to 16. St. Paul says, When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, he called me through his grace. To do what? To reveal his son in me. My calling was for God to reveal His Son, Jesus Christ, through me. That I might preach among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. St. Paul said, I was called to reveal Christ. 
in his life. Do you think that is just for St. Paul? You say, well, I'm not holy enough. Can that possibly be through me too? Did, Christ, did God call me to show Christ to others through my life? Well, you say, I'm not holy. Well, guess what? Paul wasn't very holy either. If you look in verse 113 in the same book, a few verses before, he says this. You heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. So God chose that person who was against him, who was trying to destroy his church to say, I will reveal my son through him. Anyone here trying to destroy any churches lately? Okay, so then you have a better chance, okay? God's calling is for us. It's not just for St. Paul. And if you don't believe me, if you look in Romans 8.29, and we studied this verse a lot, and we did it last week again, but this, whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You know when someone says, well, what's the purpose of Christianity? What's your goal as a Christian? Your goal is not to get to heaven. Your goal is to be like and one with Christ. If you're one with Christ and like Christ, you're going to be in heaven. That's, not, that's like an outcome. But many people say, I just want to go to heaven, but they don't have any desire to be like or united to Christ. Our goal is this, to be conformed to the image of His Son. It's not our goal. This was God's goal for us. Not for one of us, not for St. Paul only, but for all of us, that we are called to be the image of His Son. That's your goal. You know that there was a big uh, movement back in the day, and everyone had the bracelets, what would Jesus do? That's kind of what our calling is, is to be like Jesus Christ. And it's actually a process where St. Paul is telling us, we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Remember how last week we said we are a work in progress? The Spirit is working in us from image to image and from glory to glory to be like His Son. That is a general calling for Christians. So my focus today is that Christ is to be revealed in us, that it's a process, that the Holy Spirit is working in us. So if God's purpose is to reveal His Son in you, how does that change the way you think? How does that way change the way you make decisions? The things you say, the plans you have, the way you walk. That's your new purpose. God is trying to reveal His Son through you. So how is that possible? How is it possible to reveal His... How can you tell when someone is from a different land? What are the things that you notice when they're from a different land? The what? They speak different language. They, they speak differently. What else? Huh? They look different because... Maybe their skin color, but not just their skin color, but also the, the way they dress. The way they dress is different. Not only the language they speak, but the way they speak. And so I want us to look at something here in Galatians where he's telling us something. He says in Galatians 3.27... Oh, sorry. He says, as many as you were baptized have put on Christ. Have put on. What does that mean? Your new clothing is Christ. When you see a child is baptized, what do they wear? What do they dress in? If you're a boy, you get a little Pope white, you know, white outfit, right? But it's, it's typically white. You're wearing white because you have just put on Christ. So I have a question. Everyone here baptized? Yes. In the Orthodox Church. You're clothed with Christ. So then, if you were clothed with Christ, people should see Christ in you. So then why is it sometimes they don't? When they look at you, why is it that they're not seeing Christ? Because actually that's not what I want. 
I'm not trying to show Christ to others. I want people to see me, not him. I want them to see my talents. I want them to see how I did my hair, the clothes that I bought. I want them to see my physical appearance. I want them to see my accomplishments. I want them to see my possessions, my nice cars, my nice house. I want them to see everything about me and my goal. My goal is not to reveal Christ to others. My goal is to reveal me to others. I want people to praise me. And maybe, though, even though you are clothed with Christ, people are not seeing Christ is because we are trying to show us. We are living for me. And that's the problem. I'm living for my will and my glory and my dreams. So what did Paul do? St. Paul says, in order for it to not be about me, go to Galatians 2.20. Again, in the same book, he says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So in order for people to not see me, what do I have to do? I have to be crucified. I had to crucify my old self. He stopped living for himself. And it was very easy to see Jesus Christ in St. Paul because St. Paul was crucified. Who was the old St. Paul? Before he met Christ, he was supposedly religious, but he was angry. He was murderous. He was throwing people in jail. He was very arrogant. All of a sudden, that person, in order to disappear, had to be crucified. Well, what does that mean, to be crucified with Christ? It means the old man has to die, and there has to be something new. A lot of us, since we were baptized as babies, okay, the old man, the, the first 40 days or 80 days, okay, that's gone. But actually, we still have the old man in us, and the old man still has to be crucified. It has to be done away with. So what it means is that the old person has to be removed and now we have something new. So the new thing is a new purpose. What is your new purpose? I already told it to you. In 116, what is your new calling? Your new purpose is what? For Christ to be revealed in you. That is your new purpose. The old man had a different purpose, was to show himself. The new purpose is to reveal Christ. The second thing is this. You have a new walk. If you look at Galatians 5, 16 to 17, again, same book. Galatians 5, what is he telling us in Galatians 5, 16 and 17? He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you don't do the things that you really want to do. You have to have a new walk. The new walk is no longer according to the flesh. The new walk is according to the Spirit. What does it mean to walk? Like in your spiritual life, what does it mean to walk? That's your, your daily life. Like you walk, you move. That's where you go. That's, that's who you are. When they say walk the walk or talk the talk, walk the walk is live the life. Those are your actions. So he says... Your new walk is walking in the Spirit versus the flesh. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Yes, it means to come to Bible study every Sunday after you've attended the entire liturgy, right? But not just that, because you can come here but not be in the Spirit. You're not walking according to the Spirit, but the Spirit is trying to correct your mind. Correct your actions and your deeds. You should be able to tell someone who's walking following Christ, who's walking in the Spirit. Um, you guys know Abu Nabi Shwai Kamath, a priest who passed away in 1979. He's one of my favorite saints. And um, he was on a train one time, and there was an English lady uh, was sitting across from him. He was leaving Alexandria. And the city was full of tens of thousands of people because he was, I think he was coming to America. And she was shocked at all those people. 
She was like, who is this man? And after sitting with him, and after the train, she's like, I understood because I could see Christ in him. He was walking in the spirit. It wasn't just he had the reflection in his face, but he was walking his words, his actions, and his deeds, his mentality. Remember, we talked about the mind of Christ. So now we have to say, the way I used to walk is different where I just focused on my work, I just focused on my home, on my garden, but now I'm gonna walk differently. We're gonna talk about that. But a person who is now baptized in Christ, clothed with Christ, being having Christ revealed in them, not only do they have a new walk, but they also have a new leader. Who are they following? 525, Galatians 525. It makes sense that if you are a new person, the old man is dead, the new person is following someone new. He says, if you are led by the Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Spirit? And this is something I'd, I really want to focus on. Is it something that we're seeking? Like you go to work, you know, okay, there's an agenda for the day. You, you have certain rules that you live by, and you're following that leader. Then you have laws, and, but who, like when to be followed? Are you trying to ask the Spirit of God to lead you? In this day, in the morning, where are you leading me? Where are you leading me? How do you want me? Is there somebody I need to speak to? Is there someone I need to call? Is there someone I need to intervene? Is there someone I need to give to? Is there something I need to get rid of in my life? Is there a certain situation where you know I'm going to be in trouble? Am I looking to be led by the Spirit? How many of us wish to be led by the Spirit? You think the Spirit doesn't want to lead you? Usually we're the ones who don't want to be led. Why? Because it's going to be different than the old man. It's not going to be what you want. It's going to be what God wants. And is it better to live the way you want or the way that God wants? If you're asking the new man, yeah, it's to be led by the Spirit. But if you ask the old man, I want to live my life the way I want to, he's going to say, I don't care about the Spirit. I want to do what I want. Are we being led by the Spirit? How? The quiet time. In the morning, is the Bible open? Is the Bible open and your eyes in front of it, you're studying, you're saying, God, lead me. How many of us have that as a daily practice? Maybe in the summer where things are a little bit lax, you can show up to work a little bit late. You can spend a little more time asking God in the Bible, please lead me. Now you realize when... I'm not talking about just your day-to-day -day work. Sometimes the Spirit, if you're really following, He might lead you to a place where you've never been before. In a situation that you're not comfortable with, a scary situation, a difficult situation, and yet He wants you there. Are you willing to follow? Because He wants to use you. Are you willing to go wherever He wants to lead you? When Christ told his disciples, you're going to come follow me, but I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't have lots of food, and we're going to carry a cross. You still want to take, come follow me? You want that? Who wants the cross, everyone? And yet they did. How much do you want to be led by the Spirit? Don't say, I want to, but you're not willing to open the Bible to be led. In your prayers, you're not really spent. If you're not making an effort seeking what are the instructions, then don't tell me you want to be led. You need to have a new leader to walk a new walk. The other thing is that we also, not only do we have a new leader, but we have a new work. A new work with new seeds. Also in Galatians chapter 6. He says, Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he reap. For he sows, if he sows to his flesh... He will reap corruption of the flesh. But if he sows to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life? Again, it's very clear. There's the old man who's sowing to the flesh. There's the spiritual man who's following the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, sowing to the Spirit. That means I'm going to make the effort to come to the liturgy because that's what feeds my spirit. I'm going to make an effort to try to cleanse my life from sins because that's what leads me to eternal life. How much are we? I'm going to give wherever I can. We're going to go into some details. You're going to see it a little bit more clearly. 
but I have new seeds. The fruit in my life, am I looking for fleshly fruit or spiritual fruit? What are the fruits of the Spirit? Guess what? They're actually in Galatians. Chapter 5, verse 23. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Does anyone want those fruits? Anyone want those fruit? Love, peace, joy, faithfulness, self-control. Who doesn't want those fruits? So what kind of seeds are we laying? If you want the spiritual fruits, you have to lay the spiritual seeds. You have to be led by the Spirit. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. And that's okay. I'll, this is just an aside. Okay, We were just in Kenya a few weeks ago. And uh, one of the places God led us was to a city called Selga. Selga is a city, it's a truck stop where there's a lot of sex workers there. That's how they make their li livelihood. They really have no other choice. So God sent us to a place where we met demon-possessed people in a bar. We went to bars. We spoke to prostitutes. It was a place where ordinarily your flesh would not choose because it was scary. We were in a bar. One guy walked in with four machetes. There's like a demon-possessed couple that's like quoting Bible verses but saying, turn your cross upside. It was like a scary place. And yet, by the power of God, like that couple, after they were prayed on by the group, they ran out. They were like afraid, like they had, they were being led by the Spirit of God. It was amazing to see how God was leading us and God was providing so much fruit because the seeds that were being thrown were spiritual seeds. It's amazing to see how God works when you follow where He leads you and the seeds that you sow are spiritual. We also need to have a new law. A new law. He says the law of Christ. In Galatians 6.2, he says, Bear one another burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ? Is there a law of Christ? He says bearing one another another's burdens is that. He also says, oh yes, yeah, so let's just stop there. Bearing one another's burdens is the law of Christ. Let me go back. I want to show you how, what the law of Christ is because in the same book, in chapter 5, verse 13 to 14, he says this, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Does that sound like the law of Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. To love your neighbor as yourself is the law of Christ. Just to go on, in another book, bless you, this is in the book of James, chapter 2, verse 8, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law, what is the royal law? Was he talking about the law of the land? He says, to fulfill the royal law, which is the law of the heavenly king. You want to fulfill the royal law, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In several places, it seems like the new law for us is to love our neighbors as ourselves and to lift the burdens of others. That is, to me, one of the most beautiful things of Christians, where they have it in their mind that they want to help those who have heavy burdens. It's unfortunate, but I'm sure many of us have friends or family who have gone through or are going through currently a cancer and a cancer treatment. And that is a huge, huge burden to go alone. I have a friend where she goes to the treatments with her friends. She tells the other family members, you don't have to go, I will go. Because going and watching your family in the treatment is so difficult for them. So she goes, she takes, she puts herself in their position to help relieve the burden of the person who's suffering. How many of us know someone who is suffering, whether it be spiritually, um, whether it be financially? We know everyone knows somebody on just open Facebook, you'll find someone who is in need financially. Every There's always someone saying, I need help. A Christian, you want to know what a Christian does? They run. They run to those opportunities and say, I want to help. The Christian doesn't look and say, ah, I don't want to help anyone. That's not the law of Christ. The royal law is to love others as 
yourself. So I want you to think about this, and I know this might drive you into financial disaster, but think about, especially when it comes like someone's child, okay? And someone's child is, and you're like, what would you want for your kid? If you were to love them like yourself, what would you want for your kid? You, you send out a call for help and you would hope that they would do the same for you. So then I want to ask you, how can we love others as we love ourselves? Now I can't say give your whole bank account to every, every request, but at least you can at least offer a prayer, whether it be a small gift, but the idea that you care. Someone is in need. Someone is pleading for help. And it's our responsibility to lift the burdens of others and to fulfill the royal law. We have a new law to love others as we love ourselves. So that means you may not have as much for yourself. Because guess what? Your family just expanded. You now just included so many more people. I don't have enough for me, but I have a lot for others. This is, our, this is the one thing I really want you to focus on is that we have a new law and that we need to start fulfilling this idea of loving others. But then there's one more thing. If you are getting rid of the old man and you are a new person, you want to know what the most important thing is? You have to be a new creation. In Galatians 6, same book, St. Paul's saying all this in one book. He says this, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. The only thing that matters for a Christian is this, is that you are new. That you are not the old person. You're totally different. Are you a new creation? In 2 Corinthians, in chapter 5, it says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Can people see, and I'll say this, let, let, let's, instead of looking at it from the day we were baptized, unless you were baptized older, let's look at it from the days we were in high school and college to where we are as an adult. Now that we're mature, we're understanding what is being asked of us, and can people say, you are so different? I notice that you, you walk differently, that you speak differently. What is the words of a Christian St. Paul says, let your words be seasoned with salt, giving grace to others. That when you speak to others, are you the first person to yell and curse and use whatever? Or are you the one that with your kindness, you're like, wait a minute, you're totally different. You did not used to be like this. You were a different person where you were trying to cut corners. You're trying to, now you're, you're somebody new. You're starting to become like Christ. So this whole idea of becoming like Christ, one of the things that is important, remember how I said when you put on the clothes, and I said the thing that we want to be seen most is, is us. And uh, Abuna Rishwai Kamil, Abuna Tedros wrote a, a book about him, and one of the lines in it, he said this, it's one of my favorite lines, it says, he used to always hide behind Christ. If you look at Colossians chapter 3, it says, and our lives are hidden with Christ. And what did John the Baptist say in John 3.30? This is a verse you have to memorize. John 3.30. I hope I have the right quotation, but it says, he must increase, but I must decrease. You guys can memorize that one. He must increase, I must decrease. If you want to reveal Christ in you, then it makes sense that he has to increase, but you decrease. Let that be something that you're going to pray this week. You must increase. I must decrease. Spirit, lead me and show me how. I'm going to get to uh, one of my final points. One of the final points. Okay. Um, but the new creation. Well, what, what can we practically do for Christ to be revealed? We talked about loving our neighbor as ourselves. In Galatians chapter 6, he gives some really nice advice. He says this, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, oh, that's all of you guys, that's all, you're all very spiritual people, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, bear one another's burdens. One of the things we need to do is look out for our brothers and sisters who are falling away. Do we know people that we used to see them at church all the time that are no longer here? 
How many of them are going through a spiritual struggle? Maybe it's a family struggle, a financial struggle, and they're gone. This is our, he says, you who are spiritual, bring them back with gentleness. Don't say, I can't believe you did these things. I can't believe you. We don't judge. The goal is reconciliation and restoration. If you judge, you push them away. But with gentleness, you say, it's okay. I've made mistakes too. Come back. We accept you. That's the goal. And then he says in verse 9, Galatians 6, 9, he says, Do not grow weary while doing good. A Christian, a new creation, does not stop doing good things for everyone. He says, especially the people of the household of God, but he says, everyone. Do it for everyone. When you see the lady at the shopping you know, lot, and she's got big bags of dog food or big things, and do you just say, oh man, I feel bad for her? Or do you go help her lift? When you see the old couple that's trying to, and they can't, or, you know, are we still trying to lift the bird? Are we still trying to do good for, when you see the cashier, do you ask them how they're doing? Do you smile? Are you trying to do good for everybody? Are you the uplifting person that just brings the peace of God to everyone's lives? That's a new creation. That's, an, that's someone following the law of Christ. The whole New Testament really is how Christ could be revealed in us. Let me ask you, how does the, what is the most common symbol of Jesus Christ? What is the most common symbol of Jesus Christ? The cross. Absolutely. The cross. And that's actually what was seen in St. Paul. If you look at Galatians 3.1, he says this. Sorry if it's too small. He says, His message, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Jesus Christ was clearly revealed to you as crucified. How do you recognize a Christian? Usually they're wearing a cross. How many of them are actually being a cross? St. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I just want to know His cross so that I could share in it, which Philippians 3 we, we discussed, so I'm not going to do that to you again for the last, we did it last two weeks. But this is how He lived. We said in Galatians 2, He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In Galatians 6, He says, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. He literally did he was whipped 39 times on multiple occasions. He was stoned. He was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. Like if you read 2 Corinthians, it talks about all. He really did have, he really was portrayed as someone who was crucified for Christ. And then he says in Galatians 6.17, he says, Let no one trouble me. I bear in my body the works, the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, it was his glory. In 6.14, he says this, God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. What is the pattern here? He says, Christ was portrayed to you as crucified. In my body, you see that I am crucified like him, and this is the only way I will glory. I will only glory in the cross. So this is something, it's a little bit of a tough point, but I need to mention, sometimes the Christ that God wants to reveal in you is the crucified Christ. Is the crucified Christ. That's not a fun one. But it's a beautiful one. So let me just, I was just thinking about the crucified Christ. I'm going to mention a few points about what it means to be like the crucified Christ. He carries the burdens of others as he carried our sins on the cross. Sometimes when someone is going through a uh, a dark spiritual time that you are going through it with them bringing them back Jesus Christ the crucified Christ he accepted insults but he didn't respond that's what a crucified Christ does he didn't open his mouth to defend himself how often would this bring more peace in our homes if we didn't first jump to defend ourselves but we looked more like the crucified Christ and just accepted it he was wrong, wrongfully accused. You want to know what was amazing about the crucified Christ? He loved those who caused him injury. 
because they caused him injury, he didn't say, I'm done with those people, I don't want them in my life. But that's oftentimes our point of view. They have hurt me too much, I don't want them. I, I don't like the way they said, I don't, they forgot me, they, they didn't do this, and so I don't know. That's not how he did it. The people who, lo- who injured him, he loved them. He actually forgave those who caused him injury. He actually prayed for those who caused him injury. How many of those people, we have those people in our lives where uh, they annoy me so much and you're almost wishing bad things on them when the crucified Christ would be doing what? Would be praying for them. How many of those people that annoy us are they filling our prayers? And we're forgiving them and saying, God, receive them. They're better than that. Heal them, whatever is needed. He also seeks to save others. Jesus Christ, the crucifixion. He seeks to save others. He counts no cost too great to obtain it. What are we doing to save our brothers and sisters and family and friends and co-workers and everyone around us? What are we doing? And he did it with joy. The crucified Christ did everything he could to obey the Father's will. He says, not my will, but thy will be done. And it really was his love that compelled him to do what he did. Are we like that person? Are we like that crucified Christ? Are we accepting others? Are we defending others? Are we forgiving others? Are we praying for others? Are we trying to seek their salvation? That might be the way Christ will be revealed in you. It's the crucified Christ. The last verse I want to share with you is this. St. Paul is saying, this is why I'm laboring. I'm laboring who, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. What was St. Paul's goal for those he served? That they should be like Christ. That Christ, people should be able to recognize Christ revealed in us. You guys have a new calling. It's actually a privileged, beautiful calling to reveal Jesus Christ. It's not necessarily easy, but it is led by God, empowered by God, blessed by God, and God himself was our example. Let's follow. This week, we're going to pray, He must increase. I must decrease. And then in the morning, I want you to make a special effort this week in the morning. Spirit, lead me today where you want me to go. How you want me to act, where you want me to walk. I want to hear your stories next week. Next week, you're going to tell me. I don't have to talk next week. You guys, I want to hear your stories about how you wanted Jesus Christ to increase and you wanted to be led. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is everything beautiful, in whom is everything amazing, everything that ought to be worshipped, our knees should bow down to everything that is Jesus Christ, even the crucified, especially the crucified Christ, the Christ that loved us even though we were sinners. Who would have thought that you could use people like us to reveal such amazingness, such beauty, such love, such forgiveness? We've constantly referred to who our old person was. Dear Lord, I pray that you give us the fight. Give us the zeal to desire to be yours, to reveal you. I pray, dear Lord, that it not be us, that it be you shining through us, that it be your light. I pray, dear Lord, that you would take over our minds, that you would take over our mouths, that you would take over our eyes and our hearts. Help us, O oh Lord, to just give us, give your, our plans to you. We want to lay them at your feet, and we want you to show yourself in us, not because of our goodness, but because of yours. I realize the biggest obstacle is myself, my desire for me. I pray, dear Lord, you'd help me to learn to decrease while you increase. In your precious name, through the intercession of our beloved Saint Mother, who did the same, hear us when we are children, say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.